Hello everyone and welcome to four essential checklists to manage Drupal projects. Uh, how many people in here are project managers? How many people are dev leads? Good. How many are both? Okay. <laughs> so that's where I sort of fit in, right? Um, I run a small agency. My name is Daniel Schiavoni up in Baltimore where we're having our camp October 12th on a Friday. Hope you can make it. Um, and so I serve many different functions and follow projects. Um, I'm mean, deeply involved in every aspect of every project. Um, and over time, um, you find that you need to adopt certain procedures to help things run smoother. And one of these is checklists. Um, so why checklists? So um, I, I think I've, I ran across this, I ran across an interview with um, Atul Gawande um, who wrote Checklist Manifesto and I think I've run across it several times um, and he talks about checklists in the hospital. So there are procedures like putting in an IV that quite often uh, can lead to infections if people don't follow the procedures. And very simple things, even for well-educated people, uh, implementing checklists can be quite helpful. And they found and they proved this through many studies that by adopting these checklists in hospitals, people were not getting certain kinds of infections. They lowered the infection rate. So they started with checklists in surgery and they found that certain issues disappeared there. So I thought, well, checklists with web development, you know, how many times have you gotten to the middle of a project or towards the end of the project and you said, oops, we didn't think about this thing or we missed this small thing. So if it's good enough for airline pilots, if it's good enough for surgeons, it's good enough for web developers, right? And so here's, here's the difference between uh, what, what kind of mistakes we're trying to catch with checklists, right? So there's mistakes of ignorance where you, you, know, you don't know something or there's a fact that you were unaware of and these mistakes happen. But there are mistakes that we make and we know better. And memory is a tricky thing. And, and web projects can be quite large and last months over time. And so checklists can help uh, avoid these small but impactful mistakes that happen along the way. So I've divided this into four checklists. Uh, the first checklist is, is before you start development. And the idea behind this checklist is we want to save the developers time. Uh, time is money. It costs quite a bit to have developers work on things. If they do some things up front, it saves them time, little bits of time, over the course of a project. And over, over a course of a three month, six month, one year project, that can add up to a lot. And there's certain things you want to do in your development environment. And some of these, are pretty obvious and some of these you might already have taken care of. You might have a, a very mature DevOps process in place, but it's worth double checking at the beginning, right? So some of these are dev environment, you know, making sure Drush, Drush works in your environment, but also making sure you plop Drush RC PHP in your default directory so that when you run a Drush command, it's going to know what URL to, to use for your local development site. Right? And that can save a lot of time. Um, making sure a composer is working in your development environment, whether you're working in containers, or you're working in a, a LAMP situation, or in a Linux environment. Making sure Git is working. Making sure all these obvious things. If you're going to uh, compile CSS, making sure that uh, your gulp file is in place. You know, quite often as you work on projects, you kind of 
take and repurpose a lot of these things by making sure it's there. Um, if you use compass, making sure that that is all set up properly. And then making sure your local PHP INI, some of the settings in there can be quite helpful to, to um, touch ahead of time, like the memory limit and upload file sizes and things of that nature. Um, you might want to go in and make sure that in your local development you have uh, more logging of errors. Um, and some of that stuff should be in place, but it's good to know for sure that that's all working ahead of time. <clears throat> now there, there's some essential modules, like Drupal out of the box is not, is better in Drupal 8, but it's still not as good as it could be. So I have here, I spun up a Drupal 8 site here, just the other day in my local em environment, latest, greatest Drupal 8, dot five dot three I think or four um, and right away I had to adjust my PHP uh, memory settings to even get the install to work so and this is out of the box and you've seen all this hopefully and we've got our menus are situated this way they don't drop down you've got to drill into things and there's reasons for that out of the box. It might be that this makes it more accessible, um, that drop down menus aren't really going to work for all situations. But if you're Drupaling, you can just run a drush command and get all these basic modules in place. And we got admin toolbar, um, the develop module, Display Suite, we like to use, Path Auto, Redirect, Reroute Email, SMTP. These are all things I know that we're going to use in every single project. So why not load them up ahead of time so that um, it's taken care of and that when we develop the project, it's all going to work out much more smoothly as we go. And your list may vary, but you definitely want to keep in mind, like, what are the modules you use every time? And there's some other, like, why didn't I think of that modules, um, like Style Guide is a great one. It, it's not widely known, but it, it's a great one to kind of show how atomic and mo molecular elements are being drawn with your theme. And it's a great, it's a great little tool to put in there before theme development. Um, the environment indicator tells you whether you're in the dev environment, your local or or production, and that could be a saving grace. Um, a lot of people use panels, uh, a lot of people use paragraphs, why not get those in place early on before you begin development? And there's other handy tools like diff, which is gonna give you a diff on content. Uh, coffee, which gives you command lines to use. Command line, uh, I mean, uh, keyboard shortcuts for common uh, activities in Drupal. Um, there's advanced uh, aggregation module that you, you're going to need once you go into production or it might be nice to have in production. Definitely meta tag once you hit production. Um, and Drupal 8, fortunately, it's a lot easier or there's a lot more tools for your local development environment, including settings php.local. Um, you can set your logging, your caching, but you definitely want to visit that during your project. Uh, you might even uh, repurpose one from before or just know what to, uh, what to set in there. Uh, most of the time it's a matter of uh, uh, removing the uh, rem marks in the file. And then setting your configuration management environment, things of that nature. Um, and all this stuff is pretty well documented, uh, but a lot of developers, if you have junior developers or even senior developers, might forget to visit this stuff, and they'll end up going back once they're in the middle of development, and you could save time just by getting it up front. And now we start the build-out, and the build-out should start with users. And there's some basic settings here that we've all seen, but quite often none of us, we might not visit. Lot, like the account settings, 
Like who's going to be able to create an account in the uh, site, right? And a part of this is might should be included in your requirements documentation. Um, some of it is so basic that it might get missed by that. <clears throat> um, how emails get sent out in the system, uh, what e what the wording in all those emails. It might be a good idea to work on that wording while the site's being built to save time rather than getting to the testing period and you're shooting out emails for new accounts and it's the generic message and it's like, well, now I gotta, now I gotta get the client to come up with wording or the content, the wordsmith in the project to come up with the better wording for this and those kind of things. Um, and setting up your roles and permission and, uh, and what happens upon login. So it's always great to take users where they need to be not where the default location is. So when you log into a Drupal site, who wants to go to their account page? How many times are you gonna edit your account, right? So make sure you set that, and for different roles, you can send them to different places. So if there's, a, if there's a admin user, they can go to a dashboard where they can work with content, they can do the uh, approve users, other functions, workflow functions, you can build that out in your dashboard. Why not send them there? Whereas a, if another a person with a different role, they might need to be sent somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> so authoring in uh, Drupal 8 has gotten better. Um, at least the text formats are in the right order. You used to have to go in, and one of these steps was to change the order of them. So it, it kind of hits the first one, says, okay, um, uh, this, this text format is for super users. This person is a super user, I'm gonna give them that. And it hits the next one and says, oh, that, that person wasn't a super user, I'll get to the next level, they have editor rights, can I give them this? And lastly is the anonymous and they might get text only in the body fields, right? So you wanna, that's, in Drupal 8 that's set up properly, you might have more granularity in there or might have custom requirements that, that require changes but at least it's set up in the proper order this time. So, you know, it's, Drupal is a CMS and people like to edit and the standard buttons that come out are okay, but you know, you're gonna have to visit this. Um, and again, this might be in your requirements documentation and maybe you go through and you use this checklist to make sure things are in your requirements documentation. But we also wanna make sure it gets done. So um, whoever's in charge of configuring the WYSIWYG in your site should have uh, exactly what they need to have for, for the buttons, for the power users, for the editors, for anonymous, if you're gonna give them access to the WYSIWYG. Uh, or just for someone who's logged into the system. So you wanna make sure all that's there. There are some modules for enhancing this, like the CK Editor Entity Link module, which inserts links to Drupal entities um, and points to the source of the, of the uh, entity, not necessarily the entity itself, right? Uh, we have Linkit, it's an easy interface for uh, internal and external linking. There's another module out there called Editor Advanced Link. It enhances the link dialog, um, lets you define different attributes like title, class, ID, target. Um, then there's another module called Edit File, um, which adds a button in the Rich Text Editor to directly upload and link files in your content. And of course there's IMCE that's been around for a while and it's a lot in a lot of sites. Now in, you may be using media for this um, and that is a whole another presentation and that would mean that there might be a link in here to, um, to add media and bring up that dialog box. <clears throat> There's also some settings uh, for defining your own CSS that editors can apply. Um, there's um, also there's a it, there's also a button here 
You can see it to paste from Word because users are going to try to do that most of the time. Um, and you want to be able to filter out all that ugliness that comes with that. So uh, we go from users to content types. And uh, there are some specific settings that need to be taken care of ahead of time. You know, by default, the, uh, it's going to display the publication date. And that's something that's not uh, always desirable. And you want to catch that early in the process. Um, now we, we do our design on top of uh, the build. So it's nice to have these things sorted out as we do the live prototype typing with the uh, development site. Um, and you definitely want to um, uh, address comments. Um, it used to be in Drupal 7. They were enabled by default. Um, don't believe they are in Drupal 8 anymore. But if you're going to use them, um, you need to make sure they're set up properly. And if you're going to use the Discus module, they recently turned on ads in Discus. So you've got to make sure you go in your Discus account and tell it not to serve up ads to your end users. Um, and a lot of this stuff is basic, but it needs to be addressed. So path auto. I've seen sites and we've inherited sites that aren't, that um, you might add a content type later on, or even the original con types, content types, the default paths were not set up. So the default is content forward slash, uh, the, the title of the node, but that's not always desirable to have that content there. It might be more descriptive, it might be news forward slash title, it might be you know, whatever, whatever you have, blog for its last title. But you got to, someone has to actually set that stuff up. And we have our checklist to do that. <clears throat> um, and of course, this, uh, having that path, those paths sorted out properly adds to the SEO and usability of the site. Next, we have uh, form displays. So in Drupal 8, uh, not only do we have the display of nodes and display of, uh, we also have control of the, how the different forms display. And we definitely want to uh, make that nice for the content editors of a site. So uh, one of the things there is the, uh, in the body field, we've always had that summary and uh, and most of the time, the, it kind of gets forgotten. Uh, and, but we, all, we often use that summary, and we trim it, or we do auto trimming in the, in, the, in the displays. And what happens there is very arbitrary. So <clears throat> we have to do two things. We have to train users, content editors, and people are going to be managing the content on how to use that summary field. But we also have things like the smart trim module, which instead of breaking uh, words by character, it breaks at the word breaks, which is a lot nicer. So you can say, OK, the summary for this node is going to be 40 words, not 150 characters or whatever you have. So it's a lot neater in the front end, not, not to have things broken up by character and you have a part of a word and a dot, dot, dot. So it's a very simple thing. Early on, you can get that in, um, even before you, you're theming that part of the site. So that helps a lot. Um, image styles, again, this should be taken care of in requirements to figure out what image styles are needed and how we're going to condense images as they're put into the site so that they load, they have a good load speed on the front end. We want to think of that ahead of time and make sure that's done during the build out. Uh, again, the media browser settings too, as uh, part of the media module, which has been a shifting landscape, but um, a great way to manage uh, the files in your system, images, uh, video, uh, documents, you know, keep, keeping tabs on what files have been already updated to, updated to the site 
and being able to manage those so you know what's being used, what's not being used, which can be cleared out. But there's a lot of different settings in the media browser and that behavior can be many different ways. It can be inline, it can be a it can be a, a modal box, it can be a lot of different things there. And you definitely want to address that and make that as simple as possible for the content edit editors. Um, and then uh, view displays with um, the display suite module. There are some, there is some functionality in out-of-the-box Drupal, but um, managing how different nodes are going to be displayed and organizing those displays. Make sure you address it and make sure someone checks it off in the end. Um, now the views UI, there's there's always been some hidden functionality there. So there's these out of the box views and in Drupal A it's much better, it gives you a lot more um, of that of functionality exposed within those out of the box views like the front page view or content, the managing content, or managing users. A lot of those views are missing certain things though. They don't have a lot to them, they're very basic. Like you want to be able to search for a title of a content or you want to be able to add users or add content from those different views. Well, if you go in and edit those, you can make that a lot nicer for your uh, people who are working with the content. There are some things that are helpful to developers like I never understood why when you go to edit your view, you've got this advanced drop down on the right, which hides all this advanced stuff. Well, why do I need to click on that? It's all empty space there anyway. So you can have that open by default. And again, over time, many hours, minutes of working with a site, that can save a lot of time having to open that up to, to, to set, for instance, what happens when the view returns nothing. Right? Does it just disappear? Does it give a message? You know, the cache settings are under there. Some of the different relationships are under there. Um, context, um, different things. So why not have it open, like when you start working on the project, and save you a bunch of time while you're working with views. Also, you can have performance stats. You can show your uh, SQL query. Very helpful for developers. If you set it ahead of time, all the developers are going to have that stuff and everyone's going to be working a lot more efficiently. <clears throat> all right. So um, again, I mentioned media a couple times and media is, can be a very complex topic. Um, but we do want to think ahead of time where we're going to put our public files, where our private files are going to be. Um, and we want to have that set early before we start loading actual content in the site so we have things where they need to be and so nobody has to shift things around at a later time, which can be very involved, involve running SQL scripts and, and changing things in the database and, and it create a lot of work. But if you have it set at set up ahead of time, it's just going to set, save a lot, a lot of time there. Um, again, the image styles and then uh, while you're at it, configure all the date and time formats. So um, Drupal can be very Eurocentric this way. Uh, it can, it can wants to display things uh, or it can, it wants to display uh, full date time strings so it wants to say Jan 12, 2019, 1, you know, 12 or 13, 15, you know. So it wants to do, um, I, by default, it wants to uh, put date and times in not necessarily the optimal format or in the format that you want it to be. So if you set these things up ahead of time, someone can go in and say, okay, I want it just a date, a date only date display, which is an obvious one, which is not in there out of the box. <clears throat> so a lot of things that uh, we've worked on in the past have to do with uh, workflow automation involving a lot of email-based workflows. 
and um, and I would think most sites got a handle on this at this point, especially since uh, the level of entry to this is pretty low, but just make sure that you're sending mail not from the web server, but from a hosted SMTP, whether that's your own, um, own server, which I wouldn't suggest, or is a hosted server like Mandrill, um, which is free up to like 40,000 emails a month. So it's a, it's a no-brainer to, to make sure it goes through a trusted source so that your domain name is not uh, flagged for spam at a later time. Um, so getting those things in place early is always a good thing. But then once you're working on it, especially if you've been, it's a very large site, you want to make sure that when the developers are testing or your, or your QA team is testing, that those emails aren't going off to the world. And that can be quite a mess. So there's this handy dandy module uh, reroute email that will reroute everything to a email address that you configure. And you can even have this in your local settings.php to ensure that local developers are not uh, sending email from their local machines out to all the end users. So it's a, it's a very important piece, a lot of peace of mind to have this. It takes three, those three lines in your settings.php file or your settings.local.php file so that those, those emails don't get sent out to the real world. Um, and then rules is there. Um, it's uh, gotten in good shape now for Drupal 8, sending out um, emails based on different triggers, including just logging in and making sure someone's in the right spot. <clears throat> So we've, we've gotten our build out, we've done all our, gone through all those two prior checklists and we're down to pre-launch. We're getting ready to launch the site. Um, and it's a good idea to take, take a look through this whole group of checklists before you even start the project because you might want to shift things around a bit, uh, put some things earlier on. or it might inspire you as far as the what to put in the requirements or things that might be missing from requirements documentation. So pre-launch, <clears throat> um, you know, some, sometimes people miss that login page for theming. That's a good one. Um, um, checking your email notification text. Um, uh, what are the for three error pages, the access denied, what does that do? To me, it makes sense. If someone gets access denied, it makes sense to take them to a login page quite often. And that, that needs to be set up. Uh, but you have to decide what's going to happen in those situations. And it's good. And you have to make sure that it's been done so you, you have the checklist. Page not found error, what's going to happen there? Is the 404 error going to give you more information than a basic 404 error? Is it going to do it in an entertaining way so people aren't as annoyed as they could be? Uh, removing all your test data, this should be done really before um, before the, the client QA or before even before or before you start loading it with actual data, ideally. Um, or, you know, if you, if you read this list ahead of time, you might think, well, how am I going to handle that? I'm going to have test data in the system. I've got real data in the system, too. Is there a way I can flag the test data so I can more easily get rid of it when I need to? Or do I have, um, do I dump out, you know, some specific data to SQL so I can load it up later. Like what does that look like? That my, it might be a migration, data migration, it might be initial data load. What does that all look like during the project? <clears throat> um, you know, it's always a good idea. Come back and run a link checker and there's some ones out there. That one, that one there is from the W3 org to just Make sure you don't have any broken links before you launch the site. 
Um, you want to uninstall in Drupal 8, you can't disable. You uninstall modules. And so there's certain ones you want to uninstall in production, so they're not available. Some people are more fastidious about this than others. Some people uninstall views UI, or they might uninstall, they might definitely uninstall Devel, uh, but they might uninstall roles, the rules UI, um, just for added security. So, and there, there used to be a module in Drupal 7 that you could set it to disable different modules in production. It doesn't exist for Drupal 8. Now we do have c configs in Drupal 8, config files, and there might be a way to manage it through those. But you do want to get ahead of it and think about it ahead of time because these are things that can create a lot of work uh, later on in the project, anything data related. Um, how are you going to deal with content revisions? Sometimes you get the sites live and users are, are using the site, they're creating content and they go, oops, gee, I wish I had a revision for that, uh, that node, that particular node. So again, that's something that should be in your requirements documentation and it should be on your checklist to make sure it's been done. And of course, how backups are going to work in your production environment. Um, we're hosting a lot of, um, we host on all three, the, the big three. So we host the Acquia, we host on Pantheon, we host on platform.sh. And there's good reasons for each one of those. Um, platform.sh backs up everything as a snapshot. So it doesn't do a separate, um, a separate, automatically do a separate SQL database. It's something of a SQL backup or a separate file backup. So that's something that would have to be configured by your dev team if they're on that environment. Did I skip over? All right. So we definitely want to take, talk, we definitely want to think ahead for the site admin experience. What, what it's going to be like to actually create content for the site, you know, what, you know, is make it as pleasant experience as possible. And the right, with the right amount of attention and care, you, you know, I've actually had a client and user say, this is easier to use than WordPress. It can be done. And we're, I'm not sure what makes WordPress so easy to use anyway, but for a, for a content editor, you want to make that experience as nice as possible. So, um, you know, what admin theme are we going to be using? Is it going to use the theme that we made for the front end? Are we going to modify that in any way? Are we going to load in something like Ad Minimal or one of the other admin themes out there? I was trying out a bunch uh, the other day, and they all had different merits, but they also had different shortcomings. So it's something to think about how you want that displayed. Sometimes a little eye candy helps. Sometimes the eye candy is overwhelming and just not making good use of space. So that would be a great blog post, the uh, admin theme roundup. Um, and it's amazing how many times you don't, you don't have buttons just to do simple functions like, like adding content. Or um, if you have a view, you have views bulk operations, so you get to select multiple items and create an action around those items. A lot can be done during the development part of the project there to make the lives of the content administrators a lot easier. If they can select multiple, doc multiple nodes or multiple users and they can act upon those to edit a particular field that needs editing quite often then it makes their lives a lot easier and a lot happier. And usually they're pretty well, they're pretty well connected with whoever is, uh, who is the owner of the site or the uh, sponsoring the site. So that makes people happy. Um, your cross-browser testing and your, your responsive testing, that's definitely something that 
should be in the requirements, but again, we got to make sure that it all happens and it all happens at the right time. And as soon as you change something, it might have to happen again. So you, you definitely have to get ahead of this. Um, you know, a lot of it can be done with Firefox and its dev tools, but then you're in Firefox. What is it going to look like in other browsers there? Uh, edge can be problematic. How are images going to look uh, on retina displays? That's a lot more resolution. Than, you know, by now, we might be getting used to that, but we have to make sure that's all done properly. Um, SVGs are starting to get wider adoption, which makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, the browser is a vector medium. It changes shape, it changes size, it changes resolution. Uh, vectors make sense. And we use everything in bitmaps. We're measuring things in bitmaps. We're measuring font size quite often in bitmaps, which is silly because 14 pixels means something different on different displays, right? And there's some other hosted tools for doing some, uh, some different platform testing like Browser Stack and Soft Labs. So everyone, SEO is still something people are concerned about. They, they, they invest in their websites a lot of time and a lot of money. They want it to be found. Um, meta tag is definitely something you want to get your uh, handle around. Um, you know, how is, if you have things shared from your site, what is it going to look like in different social media programs? What is it going to look like in Twitter or Google or Facebook? And you can control that with, with um, with the meta tag module, you can also set up some defaults so things are attractive uh, by default. You want to, you might want to, you definitely want to train your content editors on how to use that and how to control that. They can change what picture shows if something is shared and uh, what format it takes, whether it's a big picture or a summary in a picture, uh, those kind of things. Um, and you want to get XML sitemap or simple sitemap loaded in the site so that you can submit it through uh, Google Webmaster Tools and Bing. And there's still the module SEO checklist that is nothing but a checklist. So if, since this is a presentation on checklists, it's worth mentioning. And then uh, before you launch, you definitely want to scan those logs again, especially you know, you project managers want to do this because, you know, that's where the developers are hiding all their sins is in those logs. So you go, go up to the menu, go up to reports, system log, check it out. And then if, when you see all these uh, errors in there, they're slowing down the site. So get the developer to kind of track them down and knock them out. Spend a little time there knocking out those errors. They will be there no matter how good of a programmer they are, um, things happen and you'll get warnings. Um, right now we're kind of shifting Acquia now, sunsetted, they moved everything to 7.1 PHP. All depreciated code is no longer allowed in 7.1 PHP. So we're at a flexion point now where um, if you don't think ahead of that and you don't write your code uh, the more contemporary way that you're going to run into errors and troubles later on. Um, in our stack, in our application stack, we have to remember every, they're all move, these moving pieces. PHP is one of the, the bottom pieces that's been moving kind of slowly. We still have some 5.6 uh, PHP um, uh, out there on the servers. There's a lot of depreciated, uh, uh, it's always interesting to go to the PHP site and they have a map of when things are being depreciated and, and I guarantee um, I guarantee there's still like a lot of servers out there with PHP on them that's no longer supported and uh, and those servers need to be updated and that's going to force a lot of sites to be updated and that's a process that has to continually happen 
for your new site or for your refresh site, you definitely want to make sure that um, maybe run run test in different PHP environments, maybe test in 7.1, see how it's going to handle. Is it just going to throw up a white screen? Is it you know, give you a crazy message? Or is it going to throw up errors in the log? Definitely want to look into that, especially if you've got a larger project happening. And there are some modules that will take the log, instead of putting in the Drupal log, it'll put in the syslog, and sometimes that's that is something that you want to happen. Um, you definitely want to manage your redirect to everything should be at this point be on SSL certificates and, and redirecting to HTTPS. Um, the search engines are going to favor that. They're also going to favor um, sites that are responsive over sites that are not responsive. So. There's definitely a lot of impetus to do it. The good news is that there's a lot of, of free or next free ways to do that now, like things like Cloudflare, which um, is like a hosted uh, DNS and does a lot of, has a lot of security tools, a lot of trafficking tools, and is free up to a certain point and gives you the free SSL. So you, you definitely want to have all that happening for you. Uh, if you're on Apache, you got your HT access file to do some of the redirects. Uh, if you're on Pantheon, you do your redirects in your settings.php file. Um, and, uh, and then launch, you're going to finally point your DNS. And then you're going to have to test again after you do all that. Because you've changed some major things here. So every time you get to a milestone, there's more testing. The more testing you have, it's better that you catch it than the client catch it or the end users catch it. So you're factoring a lot of testing along the way. Um, it's funny, we never test on Friday and Platform has a t-shirt that says test on Fridays. I, I still, I'm still not willing to risk my weekend, um, but that's up to you. Launch on Monday. Uh, here's a snippet to do all the SSL redirect and the HTTPS redirect in your settings.php file. Some environments don't. This might be problematic, but it works in Pantheon. It's in their documentation. And uh, these slides are up online. You can get them. And uh, what's more, oh, not yet. Um, and then lastly, you're launching, you want to make sure you want to tighten up all your caching settings, turn aggregation back on and, and for JavaScript and CSS. You might want to go into views and turn on caching. I've seen situations where certain views don't like caching. So maybe this is something that moves up in the list um, to see how they react. Again, once you've switched from a dev test to a live production environment, all that's going to work differently. You might have memcache, you might have some other caching mechanisms in the live environment that affect that. So if you do go in at the simplest settings, setting like setting caching in a view, you actually someone actually has to look at the view to make sure it's still working after they've done it. Um, and, you know, the, the idea behind all this is that so users don't see errors, you know? We want, we, we want to see all those ahead of time as developers, as project managers. We want, to, we want to see all that stuff. We don't want end users or clients to see those. Um, and then uh, post-launch, more Google Analytics, configure your webmaster tools, and you know, this should be a part of the project. You know, we're web agencies, we're, we're uh, departmental um, groups, we're dealing with the web. Who knows best how to set this stuff up? There's different pieces to set up um, in order to have things on Google Analytics or whatever uh, platform you're on. Um, and then submitting the site to search engines. Uh, and this one gets missed a lot, and this is one that I would put ahead of time in the requirements. Like, how are we going to announce this new site that we spent six months 
um, to a year building. You know, are we really ready to brag about it when we get to that date? Or are we just so frazzled by the development process that it was the last thing on our mind and we missed it? So as um, owners of sites, we definitely want to have a plan for letting people know a new site has been launched that to bring in users. What's our plan to reach out and bring people to the site? As web agencies, we want to be able to brag that, hey, we built this great thing for our great client. So you definitely want to get ahead of that and um, make sure you have a plan ahead of time so you can check it off. Um, and so, as I mentioned slightly, this is in a Google Doc, um, which can be gotten to here. It is editable. And so, um, I would ask that if you found this valuable or if you plan on using some of this to visit the Google Doc, feel free to make some changes, additions, comment, where it could be improved. It definitely could use some improvements, but it would be nice to have a nice a checklist for uh, building out, design, develop, launching a Drupal site where we could go and we could check everything off and we'd be absolutely sure everything was done, everything was addressed in some way. And like I say, I think um, the more I look at these checklists, the more I think like it's great to read through this even before you're doing your requirements documentation to make sure that everything is addressed even by requirements. Um, so now it's uh, questions. The big uh, item here, uh, again, I'm Daniel Schivoni. I'm with Snake Hill Web Agency up in Baltimore. And uh, we have our meetup group every second Wednesday of the month at Bertha's Restaurant in Fells Point. We have our camp coming up October 12th, Friday. We have a Slack channel. And uh, we even, yeah, if someone's with a small, if you consider a small dev shop, um, which, um, which there are a lot of, uh, we even have a Slack channel for that. So, uh, any questions? Come on, discussions. Who is using any kind of checklist before this? Good. And so what, what does your checklist have in it? So we only had a pre-launch checklist, but I like the post-launch checklist. Um, and we'll probably be integrating it into our process much earlier. Great. Because it's something that's an active thought every time. Oh, we launched a website. Huh, what should we do about it? I don't know. You go through all this work, and then it's launch day, and you have this, you have this freshness date of the site, right? How long do you have? before the site is no longer new. <laughs> I'd like to note about having, encouraging clients to promote it as well. Yeah. Um, it's, and I think it's especially useful for small shops that do multiple, not just virtual development, but maybe communications or whatever. It's an opportunity to leverage your work into other avenues. Cool. Cool. Somebody's ringing. Is that me? Anybody else? Anybody else use uh, some sort of checklist or Yes. Um, we use uh, we use a, for lack of a better term, a hybrid agile approach. We're not completely Scrum agile. Um, what we do is we break up our project into uh, four-week sprints. Each sprint has a week of planning, two weeks of development, and one week of testing, and they overlap. It's a process that um, I stole from Matthew Saunders, who worked on, now he's getting his law degree, I think, but he worked on, um, what was the site? It was a big magazine site in, uh, in New York, but, um, which actually they did Cowboy on. But, um, so what, the, what I like about it, and I have a nice graphic, unfortunately this isn't the talk where I talk about it, but, 
you make sure that development is always happening, but development's always happening, planning's always happening, and testing is always happening. And then about a year and a half, two years ago, we changed it. We, we got frustrated with doing design uh, first. It just wasn't working. So now we design kind of lays across the build out and the theme gets designed as the site's being built out. So you're, you're almost doing, you're doing live prototyping with the dev site. Because Drupal, Drupal spits out all the hooks. <clears throat> it's like being in a gallery and you just got hooks on the wall, right? And then you bring in the paintings and you've got to put them on the existing hooks. Well, you don't want to be, set yourself up so that you got to put all new hooks in the wall. And so if you, if you kind of, if you kind of accept a lot of what Drupal's going to spit out at you and repurpose it, the design process goes much better. Whereas if your design is ahead of time and has, has no sense of what Drupal is spitting out, then your programmer gets to, say, like a calendar display or something like that. And suddenly it has no relation to what Drupal's spitting out. And you at least have to know that that's going to take a significant amount of time more than doing it the easier way, right? And, and at least you have to make a, a informed decision about that, to say, no, I really want it to look this way, even though it's going to take 10 times the amount of time, and somebody's going to pay for that time. So, um, so that's why we do the development over the top of the uh, build out and development time. And then when all that ends, there's, the, there's more testing at the very end and client QA and making sure everything is OK before it goes to launch. Uh, you know, quite often you, you're dealing with an arbitrary launch date too. Like a client says, "Oh, you know, comes to you in July and says, oh, we want this by the first of the year,' right?" <clears throat> and I don't know how many times my holidays have been destroyed by the arbitrary date, right? <laughs> so, so why does it have to be January first, right? Is it? Are you even going to be at work January first? You know, you know so. Uh, yeah, so that's the, does that answer methodology? It's, yeah, Matthew Saunders did a great presentation, you, know, you can look it up. He, I, the video, he might have video of it online, but I know the slides are there. And uh, so we, we, we took from that. Saunders, S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. All right. Anybody else? Discussion? Questions? Comments? Things to add to the checklist? Nothing? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming and enjoyed having you. I hope this was useful. Please go to the doc. Feel free to, you know, mark it up, you know. It'd be great to have something out there that we could share with people and make things go smoother. Thank you.